the afternoon session. So this session uh, has one talk, and then we have a, a few lightning talks that follow it. Um, please keep in mind that at the end of this session, everyone must leave the room immediately. Do not hang around. Do not stay here to chat. Please leave the room immediately. If you do hang around, you will be shooed out of the room. <laughs> OK? Um, we have the AGM afterwards. And um, only those who have a sticker on their badges are allowed into the AGM. So um, uh, you, you, you will have to come back in. Um, and there is no coffee break after this. The coffee break is only for those who are attending the AGM. OK. And with that, we're going to start the, the session for this afternoon. I would first like to call Vittorio Bertola from Open, Exch uh, Open Exchange, who's going to talk about what's the DNS anyway. Wow. OK, so well, uh, my talk is not a technical talk. I, it's really more of a conceptual train of thoughts that I want to share with people to, to get some feedback. And so this is basically, I, I hope we will have a, a chat about this in the, in the break for the people that will still be here. So this started basically around the encrypted DNS deployment discussion and especially started from Mozilla's presentation at the IETF 105, in which they seem to have a clear idea of what the DNS is and what the DNS is not. And so even if in the end I don't agree with, with their conclusion of what it is and what it is not, I mean, I started to think, but do we actually know or have an agreed uh, vision of what the DNS is, what, what it should be, what are its requirements, what's its purpose, at least uh, today. And so, I mean, while I was having my holidays in Quebec and watching the storms, I, I started really to think, uh, what's the DNS anyway? Do, is there, I mean, I started looking for a definition of the DNS. So I actually, if you start looking for a definition of the DNS, it's, it's very hard to find one, I at least in the technical documents, in the specifications. Of course, in in the first RC, like uh, 1034, there is really no definition. It's just as, as a description of how it works. And even in the DNS terminology, RFC, is there is not a definition. It says it's defined everywhere, but then it doesn't say actually what the definition is. And uh, in the end, it speaks about a protocol, but I think the DNS is much more than a protocol. So if, if you go, I mean, the industry has all sorts of de definitions there, like uh, the DNS connects URLs with the IP addresses, which is really sort of face palm. No, but, <laughs> but I mean, some, uh, some others are slightly better. Wikipedia is a pretty good one, which is weird for Wikipedia. But, but in the end, uh, when I um, asked even the DNS gurus, people that are m much more than me, they are into the, the DNS and the technicalities, they tend to mention that this is a distributed database. And this is exactly what I wanted to question. So is it really a database? Uh, isn't, isn't it more like a direction, a navigation system today? And uh, I started for, I mean, trying to find out what the two things could be and uh, what's the difference between the two concepts. So uh, and if, if you really think, I mean, a database is something that uh, gives you a values uh, when you query it for a key. And this is how most of the DNS works and definitely how it worked in the beginning. But uh, a direction system is more like a, a policeman on the road that sends you to different places depending on who you are and where do you want to go and what's the time of the day and what's the traffic and uh, all other things. And uh, I think that maybe that the second model is more similar to what the DNS is actually doing today. So there, are, uh, there is a long list of things that the DNS is actually doing and, uh, and this would not be possible if we had a traditional database. And I mean, since in this discussion on the encrypted DNS deployment, uh, this is, I mean, often this is presented as this is a da database, but then there are people that are lying and they lie because of censorship or because of some bad purposes. This is not really the point. If you have a look at uh, the reasons why there are things that uh, give you different responses to the same query, they are, uh, really are because of other reasons. I mean, except for censorship, but there's many other cases of, uh, of customized or tailored or filtered or whatever replies that are not connected to, to censorship. And uh, actually, I, I found this kind of this train of thoughts pretty useful to understand why uh, in this discussion we have been arguing a lot over who is gets to choose your resolver. If this were a database, it, it wouldn't uh, really make a difference I mean, uh, the about the choice of resolver. Uh, well, in, in the end, if you have a direction system, uh, of course, who gives you the directions is fundamental. It's basically determining what you get out of the system. 
So I, I th I'd say that today the DNS is more like a direction system. And I, don't know, I know that many people don't like this idea, but uh, it's actually how what it does today. And so, I mean, if you, up, if you try to apply this conceptual model, actually things uh, seem to have a, a, a sense. Uh, anyway. I mean, the, the fact that the resolvers are increasingly complex and there, there are this strain in the DNS camel because maybe the DNS was not actually meant to be so complex and to, to have this not really database uh, way of working. And uh, the fact that now we are really focusing on channel security, of course, if if who gives you the direction is fundamental in the result uh, you get, the then securing the channels is really, really important. And you need really need uh, this kind of private authenticated connection with your resolver. While if this were just a database, maybe it, it wouldn't make any difference. And uh, at the same time, the resolver becomes the source of trust. So in the end, uh, there are no lies. Actually, the truth is whatever your resolver is, is telling you. Maybe this is not really a, a, a good piece of news. But I, it's actually uh, in how, how this works in, in this model, because in the end, whatever the resolvers, I mean, wh wherever the policeman is sending you, th that's where you are going to go. And so uh, this is why I see, I mean, this also explains why we are seeing all this tension around DNSSEC and the people that all of a sudden come to the DNS community and say DNSSEC sec is not necessary anymore. I, it's just enough if we encrypt the channel and authenticate the resolver. And I, I don't agree with this, don't particularly agree with this. I think we still need DNSSEC. But if you look at the DNS from this other angle, then it's clear that uh, you maybe you don't really need it. I mean, because it the, the important thing is just the resolver that you're getting and the resolver is giving you the responses you need to get. And in the end, uh, of course, in, in this architecture, the resolver is a great control point. Because in the end, uh, the you are bound to accept whatever the resolver is saying you. And, uh, and the resolver actually is the only point that knows you and knows the rest of the network and can find out what the best direction to give you. And so, well, I will keep this in the interest of time. I will just say that uh, the other problem, however, is that in this case, the resolver is also your biggest potential enemy. Because in the end, you are at your resolver's mercy. So if you have a resolver that is cheating upon you or that is sending you to the wrong place, then you're stuck and, uh, and there's no one that can save you. So actually, I think that uh, uh, there is the need to have a discussion on this. So I don't know if I got this right. And then I'm sure that there are people with different ideas. But maybe it, it's time to have a separate line of thought on what the DNS is actually today and what it's meant to be and whether we uh, have an agreement on that. Uh, otherwise, we, we start discussing specific aspects of, of the whole architecture and uh, arguing over, for example, the selection of resolvers, or but, but because we're really missing the, the, the big picture and the fact that we have no agreement on the big picture and on basically the requirements of, of DNS as a system as a whole. And so I, I think that uh, the maybe the discussion we need to have uh, is not just focusing on specific aspects of uh, or also. I it's important to focus on the specific protocols and technicalities, but maybe we should also have a thought of where, where do we want the DNS to go and what do we think it should be tomorrow. So thank you. Thanks, uh, Vittorio. Sorry. Uh, were there any questions for him? Because we still have a couple of minutes. Uh, we'll take a question. Yes, we still have a few minutes. So if, any, any, if there's any questions, then... Um. Uh, just one thought, really. Uh, while the bulk of the DNS in terms of A and quad A records and so on is you know, directing you places, uh, other less used pieces of the DNS are not so much about directing you places. Uh, so uh, uh, increasingly things like you know, ESNI keys or TLSA records or even application configuration information that might be in DNS uh, is a lot less about where you should go and more like a database. And, th and those areas might evolve. <laughs> so I think DNS is simultaneously you know, multiple things to various audiences. Uh, and some of it is, you know, a fish and some of it's a bird. And, you know, I don't know that we ultimately get a single view of what it is and isn't. People will distort it to their needs. Hey, uh, Tail from Oracle. Um, I guess one of the big questions I have, it, like I, I dislike when people, not you, other people in arguments dismiss things as being, that's just semantics, semantics don't matter. And I think semantics matter a lot. Semantics are how we are able to do our jobs and all. 
I'm not really clear though on why not calling it a database is useful because uh, like you say, a database has a key, you know, you know, key and you look it up and you get your answer. I submit that the only um, that what makes the DNS interesting as a database in the context of all these direction things is that it, it uses really complex keys. So it's not just queue name and queue type, but origin address and malware policy and all these other things are all key input into the database. And so I'm not sure where the benefit of saying, well, it's not a database because of these other things. How how is that helping? And I'm not trying to discourage, no, like, no. I, th I think this is an important conversation to have. I'm just not quite sure why we're trying to avoid calling it a database. Yeah. I mean, the, partly it's a matter of words, as you say. Partly it could be that if, if the database starts to have so many um, keys uh, that you have to put together, then you lose track of the keys and it's really, I mean, like, I mean even the policeman on the road will give you a, a, a reply based on a number of factors and keys. Then it, so, um, yeah. All right, thank you, Vittorio. <laughs> Next up, we have um, five lightning talks. And lightning talks are uh, just short presentations of five or 10 minutes. Um, I will not allow questions unless there is time. Um, and a note for the presenters, the timekeeper will indicate to you uh, the end of your presentation. It's not. It the, it's the, the, there isn't any time for um, questions. So, so the the timekeeper will tell you when your presentation is about to end. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. And with that, uh, um, I'd like to welcome Martin Willink from SIDN, who's going to talk about Entrada. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I would like this op opportunity to um, tell a little bit about our uh, uh, system we developed for uh, analyzing passive DNS data. It's called Entrada, and uh, it's been around for uh, for a while. Um, but we recently developed a new version, which makes life a lot easier if for people that want to use it. So this talk is a little bit about that. Um, let's. Oh, just. Uh, how do I go to the next slide? Ah, okay. Oh. So, um, previous versions of Entrada are, are Hadoop-based, so and it works great. And the only problem is that you need to know something about Hadoop, too. And unfortunately, Hadoop is quite a complex beast. It takes a lot of knowledge and effort to install Hadoop and maintain it. And uh, you need hardware or provision Hadoop clusters on, on virtual machines. So that uh, yeah takes a lot of time and effort. So in, in uh, Entrada 2.0, we added a uh, couple of new features, and one of them is, to, is a feature that allows you to run Entrada serverless. And what that means is that you can run it in the, uh, current in the uh, Amazon cloud, and you would not need to configure anything uh, in the cloud as virtual machines or whatever. Um, just configure a few options in Entrada, and Entrada will do the rest for you. And so we also added support for multiple uh, query engines, and added some code to analyze RTTs, which uh, you can use to analyze the, the, the quality of your service. And to li make life uh, even easier, we also dockerized the whole thing, so you can just run it as a container, which yeah, makes installing like really easy. Uh, so a little bit about serverless analytics. Um, so as I said, you, you, it just means you run it in the Amazon cloud, but you don't need to spin up virtual machines yourself it uh, just uses uh, uh, what Amazon calls Athena, which is a query engine, and S3. And uh, Entrada will just uh, take care of uploading all the data to the correct S3 bucket, set security uh, as you would like it. And uh, c yeah, takes care of the entire workflow from converting data, uploading data, and optimizing data. Uh, everything is done for you. So yeah, the only thing you would need to do is just analyze the data. And so the advantage of this is that, yeah, you don't need to have any hardware or network or whatever. So you can just focus on the, on the data. Yeah, I basically just mentioned this. <laughs> uh, so it, it uses AWS, S3 as storage, and the Athena query engine. And pricing is like $5 for each terabyte scanned. And because the data is, uh, uses the Parquet format, which is a columnar-oriented format, the actual 
the, the average SQL query doesn't use that much um, uh, data or doesn't scan that much data. So you can get a, a quite uh, quite a whole. Um, you can analyze quite a lot of data for just five dollars uh, per terabyte. Um, so um, somebody from um, CZNIC presented a while back about analyzing RTTs from DNS data, and he had some re really nice graphs. And well, we were really impressed, and we thought, okay, maybe it would be nice if we add something like that in Entrada to make to allow others to do the same thing. And um, the nice thing for, for uh, about this is that if you use the data from uh, normal real-world clients, then you might see something different than when you, are for instance, use the data from uh, uh, RIPE Atlas probes, because the distribution might be completely different. And the data you see in your uh, DNS data is usually real. You know, well, there are a lot of probes, but if you, you can filter out the probes, and then you end up with just the real clients. And if you analyze the RTTs of the real clients, you might see something different than what you see from the, the uh, Amazon, uh, sorry, Atlas probes. So uh, just uh, really short about how, how, how does this work. What we do is we just look at the TCP handshake. Uh, so when a resolver sends a query and wants to use TCP, it needs to uh, set up the, the TCP connection. So there's a handshake, and uh, there's a SYN, SYN, ACK, and ACK uh, series of requests. And we look at the time difference between the server SYN, ACK, and the ACK coming back from the resolver, and that's the RTT. And when we look at the uh, uh, authoritative data for .NL, we see that on an average day, between four or five percent of all queries use TCP, and that's about 26 to 26, uh, sorry, 22 to 26 percent of all unique resolvers. So that's quite a, yeah, it's, uh, th those are a lot of potential probes that you can use then. And so this is for one, one day in, in this month, um, just to see, okay, uh, what, what networks or what ASNs have a relatively high RTT, average RTT to our uh, name servers. So most of them are from China. And if you look at the, 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 the top, uh, the highest one has, has an average RTT of, of almost uh, 1,200, uh, well, well over 1,100 milliseconds, which is quite high. So uh, that's just, because I was curious, I zoomed in to this ASN to see what was going on. So, and here you see a chart for, uh, uh, I think this is October, and it's probably too small to read, but on the, on the y, uh, x axis is the number of days in October, and the y axis is the number of milliseconds and the number of uh, uh, probes. The blue line is the, uh, the RTT, so you can see that usually this AS has a, mm, pretty good RTT, it's relatively low, and at the end of the month it spikes up, and we also see that the other line, the orange line, the number of samples we uh, received is also going up. So this can mean two, either two things, either they having, they're having network problems to our name service, or maybe uh, they're querying for uh, big, uh, uh, or they're getting large responses, so they get truncated responses and they switch over to TCP. Uh, I don't, I don't really know what, what's going on here, but it's interesting to see that you can just zoom in on an ASN and try to figure out what is going on. And finally, we uh, created a uh, Grafana dashboard for our operations people, so we can just see during the day, okay, what is the, uh, the average TCP RTT on our system, so we can look for each, uh, we can see each of our name server Anycast sites and show this graph and see, okay, uh, is there any, anything funny going on here? Do we see high RTTs? Or maybe we need to look into that, or maybe not. So this is quite useful uh, tool to have. Yeah, that's already it, so, well, I think. Uh, thanks, Perfect. Martin. Yeah, thank uh, we do have time for one, maybe one question, if anyone would like to ask. Uh, Okay, thanks, Martin. Thank Next up, we have um, Victor Dakovny, who is going to present about uh, Dane and DNSSEC survey.
and Victor, you have 10 minutes for this presentation. Okay. And Thank then you. you have five for your next presentation. All right. Um, so uh, the, the survey grew out of some work that was started in about 2014, uh, specifying the use of Dane for SMTP. I came into that from Postfix, uh, wrote the uh, implementation of Dane for email. Uh, Wes Hardarker and I co-wrote the, the draft that defined Dane for SMTP and updated Dane more broadly. Uh, and then uh, I realized that uh, given that infrastructure evolves very slowly uh, and adoption is going to be very incremental and take multiple years, if the early adopters feel very little pressure to keep their systems correct and they just deploy it and forget about it and don't monitor anything, uh, they won't see any breakage early on because there'll be very few people verifying or deploying Dane. And so the system is liable to collapse through negligence as most of the Dane deployments would then be invalid and further deployment would be essentially discouraged. Uh, so I decided uh, uh, to uh, create a survey that would track Dane deployment and create a corrective back pressure on the folks who are uh, uh, in neglecting their deployments. Um, and so uh, uh, I run the survey, I wrote the code for it. Wes is providing a uh, website for which you see the URL on which some of the aggregate statistics and so on are reported, but the motivation for the survey uh, really wasn't, uh, what do I point out? Uh, top button, ah, oh, thank you. Uh, the, the motivation for the survey was really about monitoring the uh, TLSA records and nagging the poor folks who uh, aren't doing it properly, are not uh, implementing monitoring, are not taking care of their systems. As a side effect, I get a byproduct of all these statistics. And they're useful, they're useful to make a case for, you know, you should adopt Dane, lots of other people are doing it, it's moving along and so on, but really the primary goal all along was to get Dane over the hump where it's no longer a tiny number of domains doing it. Maybe enough large providers are doing it, so if you misconfigure your system, pretty quickly you might not get email from, let's say, Google or Microsoft if they ever implement Dane outbound. Uh, and then you would really be motivated to fix it promptly, and maybe I can stop doing my survey. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Uh, I've been doing the survey for about four years now. Uh, there's probably a few more years left uh, before the thing is self-sustaining. Uh, but that's kind of the history of, of how we, we got here, uh, of the uh, survey going on. Uh, and as I mentioned, I nag people who get it wrong. Uh, over the last five years, I've sent about 6,000 email messages uh, notifying people that they've forgotten to update their TLSA records. So that's uh, you know, 6,000 cases that might have all been broken but aren't, um, by and large. There's a small number of people who ignore my notices, but they're, they're small enough to not worry about too much. Okay. All right. So uh, I wrote the survey code. It's running, on, it's running out of my home, home machine. I have a tiny uh, uh, a super micro machine, hopefully not compromised by any malicious uh, hardware implants. Who knows? Uh, and um, the super micro machine, uh, you know, I have a home, uh, you know, a Fios line from Verizon, and, you know, it works pretty well. Uh, on that machine, I have a Postgres database, and I have an unbound instance and all that wonderful stuff. And it's able to do the survey in about five hours, scanning 10 million domains uh, on a pretty low-end server. It's 25 watt because I don't want noisy server in my apartment. So this one's reasonably quiet. Although standing right next to it, I can hear this when the survey is running and when it isn't. The fans, the fans run a little faster. Uh, so uh, in the Postgres database, I collect uh, historical DS records. Uh, the, I never delete or update records in the database. I only add new records that you know, sub supplant previous ones. So I track the history of DS records, DNS key, MX, A, Quad A, TLSA, uh, and so on. Uh, and, and the certificate chains of all of the SMTP servers that I've connected to. So I can generate interesting statistics, perhaps some that I'm not even reporting yet. So if you can think of an interesting thing that one might derive from such a data set that's been collected over the past two years or so uh, when I sort of revised the database schema, older data I don't really have easy access to. 
uh, then let me know. We might be able to uh, measure some new thing that I'm not currently measuring. Um, so uh, I have my own uh, root zone. Uh, so uh, you know, I don't send any queries to the roots. Uh, but uh, other and then some TLDs, which would otherwise I would exceed rate limits, I uh, forward the queries to uh, Google, Cloudflare, VeriSign, Quad9, all of them. Uh, the more, the merrier. Uh, and uh, the code, you know, it, it's for just 4,000 lines of Haskell. Take care of SMTP, DNS, TLS, Dane, uh, database libraries, uh, con safe concurrency, all of the things that would probably have cost me 50,000 lines of C and have been very buggy uh, are done in a modern programming language. Uh, if any of you are developers, I think that we've arrived at an age when C is really obsolete for any significant application programming. You use it as glue to make system calls. But I think Rust and Haskell and so on are the future at this point, having uh, been a C developer for some decades and done this instead, I'm very unmotivated to write more C code, really, at this point. It doesn't make much sense. Uh, OK, so what does the survey produce? Uh, the first thing is we see a steady, you know, not exponentially growing or anything, but a fairly steady linear growth rate in the number of distinct organizations adopting Dane. Here I'm counting the zones, not even distinct MX hosts, but the number of zones in which I see an MX host name. And we're seeing that I'm, I'm nearly at 5,000, and we're growing by somewhere around 1,000 or so, uh, or sorry, 500 or so a month or two or whatever. So it's continuing to grow at a, at a fairly steady rate. So that's good. Dane, is, Dane adoption is not stalled. It continues on. Uh, uh, the picture is much more interesting in terms of the number of covered domains because a small number of DaneMX hosts serve a vast number of domains. Uh, the biggest contributor to that graph is 1.com, who have about 60% of the total. Uh, so some of the large jumps there are things like 1.com signing all their Swedish domains or 1.com signing all their German domains. Or the most recent spike that you see on the top right is 1.com finally signing all their Danish domains. So finally, Denmark will have Dane uh, uh, in significant numbers. That's happening this week. Uh, OK, so we're at about 1.5 million domains now. I think that's pretty good uh, uh, that have MX hosts that are Dane validatable. Um, OK, and then finally, as a by another byproduct of the survey is just purely DNSSEC uh, oriented. I'm counting the number of signed domains that I can lay my hands on at various TLDs. Some by having the complete database, so I know exactly how many uh, signed domains there are in .com and .net and various GTLDs. And in some others, you know, I'm able to collect data from various informal sources. And so I'm up to 10.1 million uh, DNSSEC domains now. I'd estimate that they're probably closer to 11 worldwide, uh, but you know, 10, 10 is what I'm able to find and, and measure. Uh, so there are the numbers, 10.1 million domains, 1.5 million Dane, uh, 7,400 MX hosts are, have TLSA records, and that's, that's the thing that's growing roughly linearly in 4850 zones. Uh, lots of users are Dane protected. As, um, large deployments include gmx.d and web.d and Comcast. Uh, it would be nice to see some of the larger you know, US providers uh, add, add, make that to hundreds of millions, but not, not yet today. Uh, and still a small residual number of domains are broken, and they are the people who I nag. Uh, some of them will fix it. Most of them fix it. A few are b broken long term, but very few of them are anybody you're ever likely to send email to. Uh, and uh, DNSSEC, uh, I'm measuring about 250 million domains uh, that are signed or unsigned. That's kind of my sample sa set of which 10 million are signed. So it gives you a sense of, you know, roughly one in 40 uh, email domains currently has DNSSEC. Uh, and uh, we also see pretty good growth in ECDSA usage. You should be adopting ECDSA now. RSA for DNSSEC is legacy. Stop doing it. Move to ECDSA. Smaller packets. You're not going to run into problems. It's more efficient. You can do online signing, yada, yada. Do ECDSA. Uh, if you are doing RSA, I have size recommendations. KSK should be around 2048-bit. 4096-bit is silly. 
1024 uh, bit is typical for ZSKs, but I recommend 1280 bit ZSKs. They're small enough to still give, to still give uh, reasonable size packets. Um, and I think I've run out of time. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Victor. Um, we do have time for one, maybe one question or two. Okay, and if not, then uh, Victor, please continue with your next uh, lightning talk. Okay, thank you. So, uh, I've been running this survey, and I thought it'd be a really cool idea uh, at the end of each survey run uh, to uh, resample all of the domains which the main survey run uh, didn't succeed in, in getting a good answer for. Uh, seemed like a good thing so that I get more accurate, more complete answers by giving some domains a second chance. Now imagine that you're a DNS provider hosting lots and lots of domains on any given day, some of which may be retired, that they didn't renew or they're leaving for some reason, so you're phasing out service for these domains. So you send the right EPP whatever request to your registry and say, I'm no longer going to serve these domains. But the registry may take some time to actually delete the, the glue records and actually retire the domains. There may be some grace period or something so that even though you've requested the domains to be terminated, for the moment anybody asking where your domain is may still get an S records directed to you. Or there may be just caches out there that still have the NS records, you know, pointing at the provider. Now imagine that the provider has relatively simple scripts and wants to just do a one-shot retirement of the domain. So in addition to asking the parent domain to stop, to stop serving the glue, they immediately stop actually serving the domain and return refused if you ask the query. So now what you have is on any given day, let's say a few thousand domains for which people are told to come to you to ask about the domain, but what you're going to be doing, if anybody asks, is refused. Refused to a resolver looks like a transient failure. He's going to try another, another name server. Okay, so uh, imagine now that you have a chain of forwarders. My unbound resolver, which my application queries, talks to an upstream unbound resolver, which may be a front end, which then distributes load across load balancers to even more uh, back end resolvers. So now we have a chain of such things, and each one of which, if it sees a problem doing resolution with one address name server that it tries, it tries another. And uh, what could possibly go wrong? Uh, well, uh, here's a, a couple of graphs that were sent to me by one of the providers. Uh, the graph on top shows my main survey run, you know, the first chance that I have to resolve every, uh, every domain. And you're seeing that I'm making, surprisingly to me, I thought it was a, by a factor of two smaller, about 2,500 to 3,000 queries a second, uh, uh, asking them about all kinds of domains. And you see it running from about 20 to 23 hours, whatever, late in the evening and UTC or something, till about 4, 4 a.m. UTC time. So about a five hour run. Uh, and then at the end, when all my queries essentially stop, um, in the bottom graph, we see the queries going to the one provider who was in fact doing this, you know, refuse early even before the domain is fully decommissioned from the parent. And you see that the query load they're seeing for the five hour run is kind of modest. You know, there's, you know, a few hundred queries a second that they're getting as a side effect of my survey. But then all of a sudden when my survey ends, uh, there's this interesting spike at the end when suddenly this provider sees 16,000 queries a second uh, coming at them from one of the forwarders that I'm using. Uh, and these 16,000 queries a second are when I've actually pretty much stopped doing anything interesting except that I'm retrying a couple of thousand domains that failed during the main run. And I'm retrying them all back to back. And my application asks unbound, my unbound asks another unbound, that unbound asks a third unbound. There's a whole chain, there's a large number, a large fan out, and they're all doing retries against the authoritative. So what I see as a tiny trickle of, of queries going out suddenly becomes on the back end 16,000 packets a second. Uh, something's not right with this picture. Uh, and uh, on the one hand, I think um, the, uh, the answer is perhaps uh, really this idea of uh, turning on your name server to refuse queries while glue records are still pointing at you opens you up to these kind of accidents. Don't 
do that, I think. So perhaps the provider should avoid landing in a situation. Uh, uh, on the other hand, maybe the name servers, the resolvers rather, can be much less aggressive in retrying on refused, especially if they're talking to a forwarder. Uh, so we might be able to think harder about what resolvers like Unbound do in terms of how hard they try to get a better answer uh, in various situations when they get refused, because the amount of amplification we got there is scary. Uh, it is much worse than the kind of amplification we hear about. You make a short query and you get a small response, and you get a larger response. Here you make a single query, and perhaps hundreds of queries ultimately ensue as a result of a single query from the application. That's, that's kind of the bad story. Okay, questions? Do we have time? Yeah, okay. So, uh, continue? Okay. So, solutions, right. So, as I mentioned, uh, uh, I stopped doing the, in my survey, the retries, and uh, the problem went away, but the exposure is still there. And hopefully, uh, we can uh, work with, with Unbound and others to make this problem less likely. Ralph Delmas, NL Labs. Um, we, this has brought to our attention really recently, so we didn't really have time to look mm -hmm. into it, but we definitely will look into this, um, consider the solutions, and also told you to see uh, what we can do here. But thanks for uh, bringing okay. this to our attention. Yeah, and I was very shocked to find it, yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Victor. Next up, we have Fujiwara-san, who is going to talk about RFC 8085 recommendations for applications making use of UDP. You have five minutes. Yeah. <coughs> Hello. I'm Kazunori Fujiwara from JPRS. I will talk about DNS and RFC 8085 UDP usage guidelines. Avoid fragmentation again. RC8085 UDP usage guidelines is published at March 2017 and as BCP 145. The RC specifies UDP usage guidelines including congestion control, message size, reliability checksums, middle box, traversal, ECN, DSCP ports. And section 3.2 message size guidelines specifies that an application shouldn't send UDP datagrams that result in IP packets that exceeds the maximum transmission unit, MTU, along, to, along the path to the destination. And an application should either use the path MTU information provided by the, the IP layer or implement pass MT discovery, PMT DB itself, to determine whether the pass to a destination will support its desired message size without fragmentation. After then, without cache poisoning attacks using IP fragmentation, RC8085 recommended to avoid fragmentation in DNS. And RFC 4035 DNSSEC and RFC 3226 need to be updated to avoid IP fragmentation. And Paul Bixi and I submitted draft Fujiwara DNS of avoid fragmentation 01, avoid, uh, avoid IP fragmentation in DNS. And it proposes UDP requesters and responders should send DNS responses with IP don't flag, IP version 6 don't flag options. And the estimated maximum DNS UDP payload size should be the actual or the default maximum DNS UDP payload size. And default maximum UDP, DNS UDP size is larger than or equal to 1220 and uh, smaller than or equal to 1400 and maybe 1232. 
and responders should compose DNS responses, responses that result in IP packets that do not exceed the path MTU to the requester. And zone, zone operator should consider small response size configuration. And how to retrieve path MTU value to a destination is get sock, get sock up to IP MTU, IP version 6 MTU on Linux. I don't know how to get path MTU value on BSD. And please review the draft. Uh, that's all. Thank you. Uh, we have time for maybe one or two questions or comments. Ah, yes. Jeff Houston, APNIC. What does a host operating system do? What? What does a host operating system do when it receives an ICMP packet that said don't frag was sent, and the packet was too big. Oh. On, on, on I'll give you a hint, it's got nothing it can do. Mm. So setting it makes no difference to not setting it, and in fact makes the packet failure rate more assured than not. So that advice about IP don't frag in four actually causes more problems than not. In V6, you can't frag on the fly. It doesn't matter. You're in hell anyway. But that first piece of advice actually makes life for UDP harder. Uh, yeah. I don't think that's the right advice. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, resolvers may retry timeout. <laughs> may need, need to retry by timeout when packet is dropped. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Fujiwara-san. <laughs> Our final lightning presentation for this afternoon is uh, by Jared, who is not here to present. So um, Ralph Weber will be doing this presentation. And he'll be talking about the Open Resolver project. Ralph, you have 10 minutes. OK. So I'm not Jared, so all the, but he's in all the good work. I'm merely presenting, so kudos to him. Um, so open resolvers are bad. They've been around for some time. I mean, Jared did talks about it. I did talks about it. We worked on it together, actually, when he was working at NTT and I was working at uh, Nominum. Now we both work at Akamai. And the website broke at one point in time. The data collection, thankfully, didn't break, at least not uh, that long and that often. Now, the good thing is the website is up again, so you can get there. And uh, the, the, the overall trends is in the right direction. So when the stuff started, it was 36 million uh, open resolver. It's now down to nine, between 9 and 10 million uh, at the moment. But there are some weird ad artifacts uh, on these open resolvers. So the normal stuff is you send a query, you get a response. But as uh, I think Jeff often told you, sometimes people, well, are curious, they ask again. And that is the uh, responses line you see, because the unique means pretty much we send one query, we get one back, and everything that's above the red line is pretty much people asking again for no particular reason. I don't know the reason, <laughs> but it is happening in DNS, so and that happens also. And there seems to be a very weird time in, in between 2017 and 2018 where these things happen more often, and that's also for a lot of the other data. So this is unique, this is good. This is when we ask one IP and we encode in, 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 in the string or, um, the IP address is encoded, so we know exactly what IP address sent that. And then we get back something from a different IP address. And that's probably mostly because some load bands are died or returns or what have you, but it is kind of like a... <laughs> well, and that, you see, because also in, in the same time frame where you have these kind of multiple answers coming back, 
A lot of them also come back from other IPs. Um, yeah, I mean, non-port 53 is also one thing that is particularly interesting. So we send an answer to port 53, and you would expect the packet coming back having uh, the source port of 53, because that's normally what things should be. I mean, <laughs> source destination, and then you and but it is not happening. And that's, I mean, it might be some CPEs uh, that are doing weird things, and the, the, the packet flow might be might be as described here, and then you get back something that's not port 53 because net, you know, everybody knows it. And this is kind of the amount of numbers there, there are there, and again, that phase where there was weird stuff is, is happening. It's getting much better, as you see in the current data set, there's not much of that happening. What's probably happening is that people are changing CPEs, and uh, well, some of these bad coded CPEs are getting kind of thrown out. Um, yeah, recursion available, I mean, that's just, uh, well, we tell you, you we can use you, but that's, I mean, again, regular stuff. Refuse is actually what we want to see. I mean, if you have a, something running on the internet that maybe results for some of, of users, uh, if you are getting a packet from someone where you have no affiliation with and you shouldn't resolve, you should answer refused. And that is kind of nearly flat. It's g get down a, a little bit, but as the overall number is also getting a little bit down, it's not too confusing. So overall trends, it's on a right tra trajectory, but it's kind of slowed down. The uh, decrease slowed down significantly, and uh, we'll have to probably work harder to get the stuff done. Now that the site is up again, people may be able to uh, contact Jared and he can give you more data on requests so that if you want to shut down some of these stuff, then he can do that and you can maybe uh, help with that. I think that, yeah, it was, okay, yeah, that, that's the, uh, the stuff that happens when you operate things, things break, you find stuff that is better. I mean, I didn't code that, that was all Jared's stuff, so that are his kind of uh, lessons learned uh, that you want to do. Uh. Yeah, questions? Uh, thanks, uh, Ralph. We do have time for one or two questions. Hello, Shane Kerr, NS1. Is this all IPv4 only scanning? Yes. Are there any thoughts about how to try to do some IPv6 scanning? Maybe yeah. look for recursor addresses on on authority servers or something like that? You could do that, but um, a lot of, I mean, one would expect that the data that you get to authority servers are actually resolvers, and hopefully these people are doing a good job and not making them open to the world. You could do that, but it's kind of like a, V6 scanning is probably much harder, and there might be others that have mastered that I don't, I'm not sure, I don't, Jared has an idea there either. Okay, thank you. Hi, Dwayne Wessels from VeriSign. Another question that I know you can't answer because you're not Jared, but I think, uh, Jared, when are you going to start scanning for open dough resolvers? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, huh. Why not? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the problem though is that the, you have, to, for Doe, you have to know the, uh, the domain. There's not an IP scan. I mean, you can't scan for IP. You can, of course, connect to an IP and then issue a query, but as the, uh, I think the URI definition usually has a host name and then a, uh, a query part. And the query part also is not fixed. I mean, yep. you can set pretty much anything. But you're expecting so things to work the way they're supposed to work, and we know in the DNS it never works that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. teasing. Thanks. All right. Um, if that was it, then thank you, Ralph. But uh, don't everyone disappear because we might be able to squeeze in just one more lightning talk.
All right, we um, have time to squeeze in one more lightning talk, and uh, Stefan Ubink is going to talk about open DNSSEC upgrades. Stefan, you have five minutes. Hello, my name is uh, Stefan Ebink. I'm working at uh, SRDN as uh, system uh, administrator. And recently, we uh, we've upgraded OpenDNSSEC from 1.4 to 2.1. And we found some issues, and I wanted to talk you, uh, to you about this, uh, these issues. Um, so that's what I'm talking about. First of uh, all, why did we upgrade? And then uh, what preparations did we do? And the uh, migration itself and the issues we found using uh, 2.1. Why did we upgrade? Because open DNSSEC 1.4 is end of life and uh, it will be uh, end of uh, support uh, next year. So we wanted to start uh, using a new version um, there are some preparations uh, described in the migration uh, tool. Uh, basically, uh, make a backup of the etc and uh, varlib OpenDNSSEC uh, directories. The OpenDNSSEC directory in the varlib directory could be very huge because there are um, the zone data there is st st stored. Um, you also have to make a backup of the CuspDB which contains uh, which keys are uh, available and are in use. And uh, during the upgrade, we found that the uh, building of the package uh, changed the option to use a MySQL database. So by default, it uses an SQLite database, and we got a problem because we wanted to use MySQL, but didn't change the uh, configuration option. And um, to be able to uh, do the conversion, because there's a database conversion needed, uh, you have to put the sum of the source tree on your uh, signer. For the migration, you have to stop ODS, install a new package, don't overwrite your configuration files, because then you will uh, lose uh, whatever you have configured. You can overwrite uh, the sample files and uh, create a new database or uh, use the convert MySQL script to do that. But because uh, it needs uh, to create a database, um, we chose not to uh, use the script, but manually create a new uh, database and change the script to not create that database because of the, uh, restrict, uh, the rights it has to uh, have to create the database. And then convert the MySQL database to a new uh, format. Um, we also noticed that when the uh, bold part uh, host was not in the configuration, the ODS uh, uh, migration script uh, segfaulted, and we made a, a bug report 244 uh, for uh, NL.labs Labs to uh, fix this, and the interval uh, section is obsolete and uh, can be removed. Uh, before starting the uh, new uh, uh, enforcer, you have to copy the zone list to a new location. Um, then you can start using ODS with uh, ODS enforcer start and ODS signer start. And we locally have a lot of scripts to make sure we don't publish rubbish. And we have to uh, change the uh, ODS uh, KSM util to ODS enforcer uh, to get the scripts running again. And currently, uh, we were using uh, 2.1.4 but that had a problem with memory management because after one and a half day, our .nl zone was uh, using all the memory of the uh, Synar system, which was 128 gigabytes of memory in use. That should be uh, fixed in 2.1.5, uh, which should be released next week. Are there any questions? 
Any questions for Stefan? All right, then thank you, Stefan. Thank you. Um, we now have some announcements from Keith. Okay, so um, just to go through the AGM arrangements again, um, we will be asking everyone to clear the room. Um, if you want to get back into the room, you need to be an OARC member, um, and you should have got a little owl sticker on your badge. If you don't have an owl sticker on your badge, please speak to any of your work team and we'll, we'll get you an owl sticker so you can back in. Um, Jerry has owl stickers at the back there. Um, Coffee will be available for the work members, but it will not get into this room until everybody is out of this room. Um, for voting representatives, um, please see Sue, and she will verify that you are the voting representative, and will give you the voting paper um, for choosing the board members, um, and also a voting card for a, a show of hands on the various resolutions. If you're an work member and you can't stay for the AGM, then please um, get a proxy form um, from Sue and fill that in and sign it and leave it so that to, to make sure that we um, that, you, that your voice is heard and that we have a quorum. Um, yep, that's it as far as the AGM is concerned. Um, and really, the, the remaining thing to do at this stage of the workshop is just to thank everybody who's made it possible. Um, in particular, all our speakers. Um, as I said, our speakers all come here in their own time and expense, and it's their own hard work. Um, so thank you to all our speakers. Um, thank you to um, Nanog um, and the um, the Avian networking teams that we've shared with Nanog and, and Aaron. I think it's, it's all gone very smoothly this, th th this time. Um, huge army of volunteers, um, not just the program committee, um, but various people who have um, helped out with the webcast and the registration desk, and um, in particular, um, Christian, who has um, stepped up and um, offered to help out the webcast when our usual webcast person, Maurizio, was unable to come at the last minute. Um, thank you to our sponsors, um, VeriSign as our annual workshop patron, and Comcast as um, the specific um, sponsor for this workshop. Um, and I, I'd also like to just thank all the staff who've worked really hard this time to, 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 make, to make it all work. Um, they, 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 you know, they're a great bunch of people who do a hell of a lot with, with, with you know, quite often shoestring resources. So if you could please just join me in thanking everybody for making everything work. <laughs> okay, so that's our work 31. Um, work 32 will again be co-located with Nanog um, in San Francisco in February. So I um, hope to see those of you who are not members um, there again. I hope those who are not members will seriously think about signing up as members in the meantime. Um, but we'll, um, we'll catch up with all the, um, the members in the AGM. So thanks.